Today, we have back with us for the umpteenth time a favorite of Poli Sci 179. Some of you have heard him before. Charlie Wiley. Charles Wiley is here today. Yes. He was a journalist for many years and covered the entire world, except North Korea, we discussed earlier. <laughs> okay. And uh, those of you who heard the news, uh, Fidel is no longer the leader. Well, Charlie may tell you some stories. He spent some time in Cuba as a guest of the government in government housing. <laughs> he was in a Cuban prison, actually. <laughs> so uh, he, as I say, he covered many wars all over the world. He's covered many countries. And he's here today to talk to you about life as we know it. Please welcome Charles Wiley. Thank you much. Uh, you know, I didn't deserve all, all those kind words. Uh, but on the other hand, I had the flu last month, and I didn't deserve that either. And so I think it all works itself out in, in, in the end. Uh, by the way, I was told uh, that I do not dress the part that you have these other very important speakers that come in here, and they have, you know, a shirt and a tie and the whole thing. And so today, I brought along a tie. And, and see, I could have worn this, too. I can be as good as those other big shot guys you have. I just chose not to do it. But there is a tie that I would have worn, which is every bit as good as any of the ties that these other speakers have been wearing. Uh, I have a problem with some of the people in the audience, because a number of you have heard me talk, uh, in some cases, several times and can actually repeat the speech with me. And so I, I feel badly that I'm going to have to repeat some things that they've heard. On the other hand, uh, I, I guess the fact that you're from the hip-hop generation where they listen to the same words over and over and over again, uh, probably hearing a speaker the second time or third time isn't that bad. I want to talk first about news media and a little bit about uh, probably primarily election coverage, because I know that you've been talking about that in class. The news media is the most powerful force in our society. The news media is more powerful than the president or Congress or anybody else. The news media decides what you think about. They decide what you think about, what you talk to your friends and, and your fellow workers, your fellow students about. The news media decides what problems we're going to try to solve, the order in which we try to solve them. But not only do they decide to a great extent the agenda and the priorities, but they, un they to a great extent also decide what is the framework within which we're going to hold the public discussion about the problems. And as you watch the coverage of, of, of the elections, you see how quickly they can turn uh, uh, turn it on or turn it off for a particular candidate. Tremendous decision made last night by, by some of the news media people to turn off one presidential candidate and turn on the other one. That's a big decision. And that is an important decision and it will have a tremendous impact uh, on the election because it sent out all kinds of signals. And so we have a news media that's unbelievably powerful. And so it absolutely is necessary, and it's the reason that I mention it in every speech I ever give, that everyone is aware that we have two kinds of reporters out there. Two kinds of reporters. And it makes a big difference which kind covers any particular story that you read or hear about or watch. And so let me talk very quickly about those two kinds of reporters. We have what we call objective reporters. Objective reporters are professionals who see their job as that of gathering information and passing it on to the public. That's what we call news. And what is really important is that they have a code of ethics that dictates that as they're passing that information along to you that they keep their opinion out of the mix. That is what an objective reporter is all about. And then we have another kind of reporter. They look alike, maybe. They may dress alike. They may even work for the same publication or the same station. 
but they're as different as day and night. They're what we call advocate journalists, and they have a different aim when they do some of their stories. And you can describe the difference between the two with a single word for each one. An objective reporter is trying to inform you. Inform is the key word. An advocate journalist is trying to influence you. That's the key word there. And there is a tremendous amount of advocacy journalism going on in the United States. The number of reporters is impossible to gauge. There's no way you can come up with a survey in which you're going to get reporters to admit that they're propagandizing the people that they're writing the news for. But there are a tremendous number. It really isn't that important what the percentages are. In other words, whether it's 50-50 or two-thirds and one-third in one direction or the other is not what's important. What's important is that there are a tremendous number of advocate reporters who are trying to pull your strings to get you to support the people and the causes they support and to be against the people and the causes that they are against. And keep that in mind when you are watching news or listening or reading. I think one other point should be made about advocacy journalism, and that is that advocate journalists rarely lie. A lot of the critics are off on a wild goose chase because they're always trying to pin down advocate reporters on the basis of lies. And actually, it's rare that a, that a reporter lies. It happens sometimes, but it doesn't make any sense because in a free society, when a reporter lies, they're setting themselves up because eventually they'll get caught, and when they get caught, they lose their credibility and they lose their job, and if you don't believe that, ask Dan Rather. That's what happens. And so lying is not the problem. The problem is more what is left out than what is put in. In other words, you can, you can report a story, and every single word can be true. But the bottom line can be at the end of that story, the reader will have a totally false image of reality because of what you have left out. And that is how most stories are slanted, by what is not reported. And a good example would be this college. Whenever you have problems, when there are outside speakers who are shouted down and harassed and so on, the media is very quick to report that. And so they present an image of Berkeley. What they don't report is that overwhelmingly the people that are doing the hell raising are not students. They are people from Telegraph Avenue that come in here and raise hell. Now, that makes a big difference in the image that goes out across the United States of this university. But it's quite true. A speaker came here and was harassed. And so the news media reports that without going into the detail about who did the harassing, and therefore the average guy across the country says, oh, there's Berkeley again. And so you've changed the image of this college simply by what you have not reported. Now, as you watch the, the coverage of, of, of the election, you find that it's been set up almost to waste a lot of time. And, and this is not only true in the case of the election, but it's true on a lot of other stories. Once you have allocated, allocated uh, resources, you have ensured poor news coverage. And I mean by that is that once you have, have assigned a lot of personnel and equipment and, and, in effect, a lot of money to covering a particular candidate or a particular event, well, now you've got to cover that event, whether there's any news or not. Otherwise, you can't justify the fact that you've put all of, the, all of these assets to work. Embedding reporters with candidates. If you have seven or eight candidates, as we did at one time, and you, you put a reporter on each one, each one's got to come up with some kind of a story 
to justify their being. And of course, you end up then with a lot of stories that really aren't stories, but are just excuses to do what you've done. And by the way, most news stories are a waste of time anyhow, simply because they cover what may happen. One of the things I do to save a lot of time is I don't read papers on a regular basis. I read them after the fact. In other words, I, I'll, I'll, I won't look at the paper, I won't look at my, uh, the papers that come in uh, on my computer. I will skip them when I'm busy, especially, obviously, and I won't read them. And then I'll read them backwards. In other words, I'll read today's paper, and then I'll read yesterday's paper, and then the day before yesterday, and the day before that, and the day before that. It's amazing how little news there was in the paper five days ago because so much of what was in there five days ago was, was a concept of what might happen. Well, now you know what happened. You don't need to know all that. And so, so much of the news falls in that category, and you just aren't, aren't getting news. And too much election coverage is about personal attacks and about strategy, or the strategy, if you will, of the campaign, and too little is about ideas and issues. Now, obviously, election campaigns are about trying to win elections. But media can focus on issues and still cover other things. It's not really news when one candidate thinks that his opponent or her opponent is a poll cap. I mean, that's not news. We know that going in. Now, you can cover that quickly. That happens, so we'll throw it into the story. But you don't have to microscope in on it. And that's what they do time after time. By the way, when you see some of the things that are said and reported, you wonder, when you look at the scene in Washington, if they may have capped, they may have put a cap on IQs over 85, because some of the things that come out of there are, are just unbelievable. Now, for years, I have been talking about the fact, and I guess I said it here as early as 1991, that we were raising two kinds of young people in America. That the teenagers of our country, even back then, fell into two categories, and they still do. And you see that reflected now more and more because what I was talking about years ago has now become true. And it affects everything, including news media. And what I was talking about was the fact that we had teenagers who lived in a teenage world as opposed to becoming trainees to become adults. It used to be at one time before we even called them teenagers, when they were simply older children. And by the way, a lot of people don't realize that. A teenager is an invented term that came along uh, primarily in the, in the 60s. In other words, up until then, you don't, you don't see many references anywhere to teenagers. We had children and then we had grown-ups. It was that simple. When you reached a certain age, you were an older child because you were in high school. But there was no separate category of being called a teenager. And then, and then we created teenagers. And what happened from there, and without going into it, because I have talked about it here in the past, is that we started to develop a permanent teenage class. In other words, we had those who used their teenage years to have fun, but also to start on, on, on the path to, to adulthood. And then we had more and more teenagers who stayed in a teenage world where they had almost nothing to do with adults until they didn't even understand the adult world. And what happened, in effect, is that when they finished high school, they did not become adults. They became older teenagers. And pretty soon we had 20-year-old teenagers. Now we have 30-year-old teenagers. We're now pushing on 40-year-old teenagers. And I think I said this last year. I let the audience in on a secret. All us old people make a deal with God. We all make a deal with God about how long we're going to live. You know, please, God, 
please, God, let me live long enough to see my grandson graduate. That's all I ask. I mean, just let me hang around that long. Or let me, let me live long enough to see my sister's son get a job and move the hell out of the house. You know, something, <laughs> something like that. But mine is a little different. Because I've watched the teenagers grow up. I've watched those who stayed teenager hit 20, 30, 40. I want to live long enough to go to a retirement home where the teenagers live. I mean, I want to see 65, 70-year-old teenagers. I want to look at the guy with his walker wearing his gangbanger pants and having his cap on backwards. I, I, I want to live long enough to see that. And, and, and the old lady coming down the other way with the tattoos on the shrunken skin on the arms, that's going to be a picture. I mean, the body piercing, wow. If I can, you know, please, just let me live long enough to see that, I'll go out happy with a great smile on my face. But, but what has happened is that as the teenagers have gone on and on, we now have them running the morning shows in, in most of the cities of America. And I travel all the time in my work, so I go from city to city, town to town. And of course, I watch the, the local news in the morning when I get up to find out what's happened, or at least try to find out what's happened. And some of these shows are embarrassing. I mean, these people sound like a, a, a two or three teenagers getting together for coffee clots to just talk. And, 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 and it would be embarrassing to a sensible teenager. They're that bad. You know, my watching last year, I, I had a bad year last year because of, of, of this kind of coverage. I remember getting up on a beautiful day and, and the sun was shining, blue skies, and I felt so good about just being alive, just looking at the world and thinking how lucky I was. And then I heard that they, they had put Paris Hilton in the slammer. And, 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 you know, my day was ruined. It was just like a rainstorm had developed because I couldn't think of anything else the, the whole day except Paris Hilton was in the slammer. What a bummer. And, I, and, and, and that morning, I got up, and this, by the way, I am not making up. This is a true event. I got up to see what was going on in the world. Maybe World War III. Uh, who knows? You know, something big may have happened, so I want to know about it. I turned on four cable news stations, one right after the other, to see what was happening in the world. All four were covering the story of Paris Hilton going to jail. But it is even worse than that, because they were not simply reporting that she was heading for jail. Each one of them had an expert explaining some phase of this event. One of them had an expert on prison cells who was explaining in detail what the cell would be like that she was going to spend her time in. I'm not kidding. This is true, honest. They had another expert on the crime that she had committed and the sentences that people normally get under the same circumstances with the same background so that I knew all about, what was it, DUI, D, D, whatever. And, and, and here I, I learned all about the history of those people who had been sentenced for that crime, and the third and the fourth, all telling me in detail uh, what, what had happened. I mean, this is insane. And, and, and it's no, no, no wonder that we're not getting a lot of real news. And the news media people that are giving opinions are not helping. I did a lot of talk shows. At one time, I was the most frequent guest on the most listened to talk show in New York for about 10 or 15 years, the old Barry Farber show. I was his guest all the time, and I used to sit in and do the show. So I had a tremendous amount of time on the air. I mean, that show was hours long, and I would do them all the time. And I also was the most frequent guest on the, on the most watched New York television talk, daytime talk show. And so, you know, Crossfire and shows like that, I've, I've done numerous. So I have a lot of background in that, and I've watched the development of talk shows and how they've worked. Now, originally, we used to 
get invited on because you had a strong opinion about something, and they'd bring on one or two people on either side. Sometimes they'd stack the deck. But you had people giving different opinions. And yeah, we, we, we'd get carried away sometimes, and we'd interrupt the other guy. It happened. We'd get hot under the collar, and we'd interrupt, and so on. And, of course, we all came in with a set view. But the difference is this. In those days, we used to bring up new issues once in a while. We would talk about new aspects of something that was going on. And so somebody could listen and get some concept. And when it came to the interruptions, when we got carried away, the talk show host was the referee. The talk show host would part us, like a, like a referee would part a couple fighters. Okay, quiet, you be quiet, you talk. Now, it doesn't work like that anymore. When they start to get out of control and start interrupting and shouting, Nowadays, the host joins them, and so now we have two or three or four people all screaming at the same time. I turn it off. How can you possibly learn anything in a situation like that? And of course, the things they talk about are all set-piece fights. Both sides come in with their crib notes, and they read them off. The liberal says A. The conservative looks at his note, and he says B. And then the liberal looks at his note, and he says C. And it just goes back. Nobody ever learns anything. Nothing new ever happens. And so we're not getting any help there. And the bottom line on all of it is we're being barraged by misinformation and disinformation at a time when we desperately, desperately need information. And I think given the time, we have about 15 minutes, I guess, 20 minutes to take, take some questions, and, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. I may not know the answers, but uh, I would give you one piece of advice. I normally try to talk a little bit about what life is all about, and when you've lived as long as I have, you've had a little experience at it. And, and uh, I have mentioned a number of times here to grab to grab that world and don't, don't give up your dreams. That's a great world out there. It's a wonderful place. You can have a lot of fun, interesting, if you just do it right. And you have to keep the dreams, and people lose those dreams. They lose them sometimes when they're still in high school. Then they lose more of them when they're in college, and after a while, a lot of people have lost all the dreams. And I just want to repeat what I've said so many times. Keep the dream. Take a shot. Even if you don't make it, it's worthwhile. Because there's nothing sadder in the world than somebody that realizes in their middle age that they never went for the things they really wanted to do and the regrets that they have. And I saw an incredible example of it recently when I was talking at a high school. And when I finished my talk and I was leaving, a lady who had sat down in the back of one of the classrooms handed me a note. And the note, which I read later, said, keep telling them what you're telling them about living the dream. She said, I gave up mine. Some damn fool convinced me that there was no hope that I could ever make it. And I didn't try. And she said, it's the biggest regret of my life. And so that piece of advice, I assure you, is worthwhile. And that world, Joey Lewis, the comedian, said years ago, you only go through once, but once is enough if you play your cards right. Learn to cope with the problems out there. Get your act together and have fun. I've gone through for 81 years. I sure as hell wish I could go through another 81. Anyhow, thank you very much. Okay, we'll take questions. Um, why not? Let's start right here. All right. 
I was, yeah, the question was, what was my experience out in Cuba, because he's heard so many different things. I was in Cuba a long time ago when I was arrested. I was there shortly after the revolution when it was a real madhouse. They were running people in, nobody even knew why, while I was in, uh, I was held in a dungeon. And, and while I was in that dungeon, we had 26 men in, in this little tiny kind of cell. And uh, they were running them in and out of there. They picked up, among other things, uh, an Israeli violinist who was there as a state guest uh, to, to play at some kind of concert. And they picked him up. And I'll never forget, as they brought him in, he was screaming, I'm not a gringo. They called him a gringo. He said, I'm not a gringo. I'm not an American. I'm an Israeli. And, and I remember the, the guards said, oh, you're a Jew, and threw him in the cell and slammed the gate behind him. And, and, and he was a state guest. Uh, it was a madhouse. And, and uh, I watched that scene develop, and you knew that it wasn't going to end up particularly well. Uh, they, had, they brought in another day, they brought in a, an Argentine doctor who was a friend of Che Guevara, and as he was being led down the hallway, he was screaming, I'm a friend of Che, I'm a friend of Che, and they said, yeah, you're a friend of Che, and they threw him in, and they slammed the gate behind him. And so uh, when I was there, it was, uh, it, it was a lot of turmoil, and, uh, and you could almost see how it was going to turn out. The guy has been there for all these years. By the way, he and I are the same age, we're only a few months apart. And it really used to bother me when I heard so many people say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about him much longer. How, long, how much longer can he be around? <laughs> and that, that kind of gets to you a little bit. But <laughs> What do you think the future of Cuba is going to be now? Huh? The future of Cuba. I think that it, it's up for grabs. I think that uh, the United States can have some influence by what kind of deal we offer them. Uh, I think it would be a good time to try to find a way to... to to back off a little. Uh, I don't know if it'll work. I do know people who know Raul, uh, the, the brother that's maybe taking over, and uh, his background is not one that gives me any great hope that he is going to be a Jeffersonian Democrat, but, uh, well, he, he's done some pretty, pretty wild things. Uh, but who knows? I mean, you know, after a man like that dies, you can never really tell what's going to happen because it's rare, really, that they can pass on power. So Raul may or may not be able to keep power, and, and the party may or may not be able to keep power. I think right now it's up for grabs. I don't know. And, and I think we might be able to have some influence, but how much, I, I don't know. Okay, uh, you heard the uh, question repeated, uh, or I'll repeat it again. Do you think it's possible to be a completely objective reporter? And the answer is no. Uh, can you be an objective reporter? Yes. That's what a professional is supposed to do. I do not think there are any reporters out there that don't have opinions. In fact, I would say that reporters probably have stronger opinions than most people because they deal on, on a regular basis with the news. And the kind of people that become reporters are the kind of people that are going to have strong opinions. So I would say absolutely, positively, reporters have very strong opinions, uh, probably right across the board. Now, the name of the game is to do your job the way it's supposed to be done. And the way it is supposed to be done is to keep your opinion out of it unless you have been asked for your opinion. If you write editorials, you give an opinion. If you write a column, you give an opinion. If you're a commentator, you give an opinion. If you're a talk show host, you give an opinion. But if you are a reporter, a straight news reporter, you are supposed to give the news. And it's false advertising to sneak your opinion in. Now. Do, does anybody likely occasionally slip and their bias comes through? I'm sure that that's true in almost every case. 
I'm sure it, I, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but it probably happened in stories that I wrote when I was doing straight reporting. But I tried my best to keep them out. And not only that, probably if you were able to look through all of the straight news reporting I ever did, that you would find that if anything, it would be slanted in the direction against my viewpoint. Because I tried so hard when I covered somebody that I disagreed with to be fair to them, if anything, I may have gone the other way in trying to give them an even shake. So I, I have no question at all that somebody can be objective in their news reporting. And by the way, let me give you an example. Ask your parents or people of that age about Lowell Thomas. Lowell Thomas is the most popular journalist in the history of the United States. More popular in his time than uh, Walter Cronkite or Edward R. Murrow or any of the other names that you may have heard. By the way, Lowell Thomas, for those of you who saw the movie Lawrence of Arabia, Lowell Thomas is the reporter in Lawrence of Arabia that was writing with Lawrence of Arabia. They don't identify him by name in the movie, but that is Lowell Thomas. Lowell Thomas made Lawrence of Arabia by going out into the desert with him. And when radio started, he became the top radio reporter in America. He had a 15-minute show, five nights a week, and he was so popular that when he changed networks, half of America changed stations just so they could stay with Lowell Thomas. That's how popular he was. There were movie theaters that used to actually broadcast Lowell Thomas's nightly news between, they would set up their, their films so that they could have a break point between two films to, to broadcast Lowell Thomas. Now, that is how big Lowell Thomas was. Now, when you talk to your parents or people of that age bracket or older, ask them about Lowell Thomas, and they'll tell you what I've told you about how he was very popular, and then ask them this. Was Lowell Thomas a Republican or a Democrat? Was Lowell Thomas a conservative or a liberal? And remember, Lowell Thomas covered the Depression, <laughs> World War II, the lead-up to World War II, the Cold War, McCarthyism, you name it. He wasn't covering a period of history that was dull. And yet, you would probably find that 99 out of 100 people who listened to Lowell Thomas could not tell you where Lowell Thomas was coming from because Lowell Thomas reported the news, not Lowell Thomas's opinion. You might want to ask your grandparents, actually. They're, they're quite young. All right, uh, someone I saw in the back there, yeah. Yeah, you in the back. Yeah, you. What can be done to make the reporters more objective? What can you do about advocate journalists? Okay. You live in a free country, in a country that has a free market economy. You will get precisely what you demand. If everybody in this room went out tonight and asked for a green chocolate bar, they would look at you and think you were nuts and say, no, we don't have any green chocolate bars. But if everybody in this room consistently went out asking for green chocolate bars, after a while, somebody would start making green chocolate bars. That is how the system works. If people are willing to buy newspapers and watch television and listen to radio news that is slanted, they are going to continue to get slanted news. If the American people made it clear that they wanted to get objective news, they would get objective news. These are people who are trying to make a profit. They are profit-making organizations, or at least they're trying to be. They will give you what you demand. The problem is that Americans across the board, 
Every survey shows that Americans think that their news is slanted, but they don't stand up and say, wait a minute, no more. And until that happens, they will continue to get uh, slanted news. Unfortunately, uh, that, that is the way that it is. Are journalists liberal leaning or more educated and open minded? <laughs> wow. That's not a loaded question, is it? Uh, many, many reports. I think that there is no question. There used to be a big argument about whether or not the media was liberal, and that argument has pretty much been decided. For example, the former head of CBS News says that CBS was liberal. Uh, uh, the guy that does the funny commentary every week on, uh, on 60 Minutes has acknowledged that he was liberal, and he said Dan Rather's liberal and everybody up here is liberal. The uh, uh, political editor up at ABC uh, has said uh, that, that they're liberal at ABC and so on. I mean, they're, they're, that is not really in doubt anymore. There used to be an argument about it, now there's not. The question is not whether the reporters are liberal. The question is whether reporters slant stories. And there are conservatives that slant stories too. The issue is not where the reporters are coming from. The issue is whether or not the reporters project their opinions into their news stories. It doesn't make any difference what you are if you do your job. If you do your job the way Lowell Thomas did, then it doesn't make any difference. And so what we need to do is not try to balance off. In fact, what has happened is when it became clear that the news media was very much liberal, there was an effort made not to get objective news, but there was an effort made to balance the bias. And so we ended up getting Fox News, and we ended up getting uh, a, a conservative news coverage. By the way, one of the great myths is that Rupert Murdoch and people like him are trying to change everybody's opinion. They're going to turn everybody into a conservative uh, by controlling the media. Well, that's not the way it works. Actually, Rupert Murdoch, and I, I reported this to you last year, uh, Rupert Murdoch at one point owned two newspapers in New York. He owned the New York Post, which was to the right of Attila the Hun, and at the same time he owned the Village Voice, which was to the left of Leon Trotsky. He owned them both. He didn't care. If your editorial policy was red, it was fine with him provided the bottom line was black and not red. And so if you had a conservative publication and it made money, Rupert Burdock is happy. And if you have a liberal publication that makes money, Rupert, Mark, Rupert Murdoch is happy. And he started Fox News, not to conservatize the world, but he started Fox News because he figured out that there was a market for a conservative network. And what's very interesting, and I'm sure some of you know it, that Rupert Murdoch, who is known as this great conservative news magnate, is raising funds for Hillary Clinton as we're sitting here today. He is raising money to make Hillary Clinton president of the United States. So much for his conservative credentials. The question was, would I uh, suggest any uh, good objective newspapers? You can't really do it because it is hard to come up with an answer to that. What you can do is to say that some publications are more uh, objective than others. Uh, the Wall Street Journal on its news pages, not on its editorial page, on its editorial page it takes very strong stands, but on its news pages until fairly recently uh, was, was, was quite objective compared to the others. In other words, more objective, not objective. The Economist magazine is 
more objective than Newsweek or Time or U.S. News. It's not objective. It is more objective. By the way, the thing that you have to do today if you really want to get news is to get different sources, as many sources as you can. I always suggest that people can read to find out which way stories are being slanted. There's a very easy way to keep track of that. And, it, and it's easy because there are two publications that you can read on a regular basis, and then you can then project from those two what mainstream media is reporting on similar stories. And they both start with the same six letters, which makes it easy to remember. One is the nation, which is unabashedly liberal, and the other is National Review, which calls itself a conservative journal. In other words, one says we're conservatives, the other one says we're liberal. And what's kind of interesting is to read both, and then let's see what mainstream media is covering about the same stories and see which side they are pushing a particular story. That way, at least you know which way stories are being slanted. Uh, the other thing to do is to go out and get as many sources as you can get. For example, my favorite source is a website that covers, I guess, 50 to 100 newspapers and other news media in the United Kingdom. It lists the websites for every newspaper virtually in, in Scotland, Wales, and, and Great Britain and Northern, and Northern Ireland. And then beyond that, it lists every continent and every section of the world and then breaks it down by country and lists English language publications virtually for every country on the planet Earth. So if something happens in Indonesia or Belarus or any place else, you can punch in that country and you will get a website for an English language publication. Now that doesn't mean that they're not slanted. They're going to be slanted. But at least you're going to be getting a local picture of a major news story that you might not be getting. For example, I was following the Turkish invasion or invasion to be of Kurdistan for months before it actually hit the American press because I was reading Turkish newspaper. Or you could just read the California Patriot and get to <laughs> totally unbiased coverage. How useful is new internet media considering blogs are generally biased? I think that there's no question that the blogs are biased because they're opinions. But I think that there's a, a, an upside and a downside. I think that on the one hand, blogs and the internet in general have forced mainstream media to be a lot more careful about stories they cover, and that's good. I think you get a lot of news that you wouldn't otherwise get, which is good. The downside is that you have no idea where their facts are coming from in a lot of cases, and so you don't know what's on there, you know, really how much of it is true, how much of it is made up out of whole cloth, and so on. And so it, 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 it's a toss-up. And I think that you're back to the same thing in the sense that you have to follow up yourself to try to find out if what they're reporting is true. And, and you can do that. And then after a while, you'll have a pretty good idea whether this blog or that blog is worth your time. I mean, if you check it out a few times and it comes out right, well, then you'll know that that's a good source. And you'll also know which way they're slanting a particular story. Right here. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Yeah. The question was, do I think there is better, more objective news in a free market system like we have or on the BBC, which is government-backed? Uh, uh, I think that you can make a case in either way. I think we should, by, by all right, have more objective news. Unfortunately, we don't. The BBC covers a lot more news because they don't cover anywhere near as much trivia. And so that's good. 
Do they slant their stories? Yes, they slant a lot of their stories. But at least you're getting news that you wouldn't get anyplace else. And so I watch BBC pretty regularly, and I watch the one that's on the uh, BBC America, which has the one-hour job. And, and, you know, I get a lot of stories there that I wouldn't get here. I would not say it is objective. They, they very frequently can get off on, on an anti-U.S. position on, on certain things. But certainly it's a good source, and, and just don't buy it uh, whole hog. I mean, yes, it's, it, it's got a lot of news, but some of it can be slanted. But at least you've got news. You've got, I shouldn't say news. You've got information, and you can then go from there. And I do. I watch BBC pretty regularly. Okay, one more right here. Behind you. Good question. Is the media just uh, focusing on the horse race aspect and not really dealing with the oh, issues? Oh, I, I think the media has been uh, focusing on the horse race uh, part of it for years, and, 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 and it's, a, it's a disservice to the American people. I mean, to, 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 to talk endlessly. I just can't believe they can fill up the amount of airtime that they fill up every single day. We have had a primary campaign going on for a year now. It was going on for damn near a year before they had the first primary. And somehow they have managed to talk about the race day after day after day, hour after hour. It is mind-boggling they can do it. And I'm just wondering how many people are still watching. You know, somebody won and somebody lost and somebody got 54% and somebody got 46%. You know, how far can you go with that? How can you go on for two and three and four hours with eight talking heads all explaining the same thing? I mean, it's ridiculous. And yet they get by. And I, I just don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd be interested to see a show of hands here. How many of you are watching on a regular basis the coverage of these primaries that has been going on? Don't you get bored with it after a while? I'll be darned. Well, by the way, that was what? About one-third? No. Yeah, about one-third of the audience is watching it regularly, so it's still selling. But this isn't a normal group of people. This is probably probably one-third. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you.